Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome back to our Jewelry Industry Voices webinar series. This is the last of our webinars in season two of Jewelry Industry Voices, which we started back in September. Um, please don't be sad that it's the last one in the series. I can see some of you are crying already. We will be back in September and more about that later on today. So good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. I'm in London and it's a rather hot, muggy afternoon here in London. Um, how's it with you, um, wherever you are? Please feel free to use the chat to welcome yourself into the conversation. We know how important these webinars are for, for connecting each of us with our industry colleagues all around the world. In fact, we've felt that myself and um, Sibjo and all the other organizations that have been webinaring for the past 18 months or so, this is part of one of the main reasons that we're doing it, is to keep connected with everybody while travel is restricted. So again, welcome back to Jewelry Industry Voices, this webinar series, which is hosted by Sibjo, the World Jewelry Confederation, looks at issues of interest in the jewelry business from the perspective of industry figures. We expect this webinar to last one hour. We often go slightly longer and apologies for that, but uh, when the conversation flows, we let it flow. So if you do need to leave, please, please feel free. It is being recorded and a recording will be posted to YouTube and will be available to all of you um, by the weekend, certainly by tomorrow. First up, um, none of this would be possible without a kind group of companies that sponsor. And today's sponsor is our virtual retail platform sponsor, Uni Diamonds. So I want to pass a sincere thanks to Mahia Bohanju and all the team at Uni. Uni is a marketplace driven to transform the luxury industry by utilizing real-time data to develop more transparency and trust in the jewelry trade. Starting with the diamond industry, Uni develops technology-centric tools and logistics services, enabling a better overall experience in diamond transactions globally. So please join me in thanking Mahir and Uni for their support. As I've said already, I'm one of the moderators today. I'm Edward Johnson in, as I said, a steamy hot London. But of course, steamy hot London is all comparative compared to other countries around. I'm joined today, as always, by Sib Joe's head of communications, Steve Benson, who's in Tel Aviv. Steve, good afternoon. Afternoon, Ed. Uh, steamy hot here as well. Um, just a few technical details before we get going. Uh, the, as we've, Ed said, the webinar is uh, scheduled to go for about an hour, but we estimate that we'll normally run a little bit longer than that. Um, at the, you are invited, in fact, encouraged to, to, to ask questions, but we do ask that you put them into the, that you write them into the Q&A box and we will, we will pose them to the, uh, to, to the speakers at the end of the, at the end of the seminar, when, we, when we've left, uh, when we have left some um, time for questions and on and answers, uh, you're of course invited to use the chat box uh, to speak among yourselves. Um, I don't have much more to add other than that at, the, at this stage. So what I'd like to do is to invite uh, um, Gaetana Caballeri, the subject president, to say a few words of welcome, and then we'll be on our way. Gaetana, thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you very much, Edward. Let me also. Uh, uh, extend my thanks uh, to all the attendees that I can see here from all over, all over the world. Uh, I was just saying as usual, but uh, every time I am truly surprised how our friends, uh, as uh, all our attendees are, are waking up so early in California or, or going uh, very late to sleep uh, uh, in Australia and uh, the other part of the world. But let me uh, express my sincere and deep satisfaction 
for the panelists. We have today a, a, a really uh, a super caliber uh, uh, panelist uh, because the magnitude of uh, this wonderful panel uh, uh, is really uh, uh, immense, I would say, because I can mention one by one Tyler, uh, Alan, uh, Mitham, and, and Mahiar, uh, uh, who is uh, representing. Uh, himself, uh, our sponsor Uni, as Edward was uh, underlining previously. But certainly, uh, I would like to, to, to say, introducing them, and then I leave the floor to all of you, that uh, uh, this uh, pandemic has changed the world uh, completely. Unfortunately, we are uh, having here, at least in Italy, an increasing of cases because uh, uh, the people is uh, behaving not so responsibly as must be and should be. Uh, but uh, the theme that we are going, uh, the subject that we are going to discuss today is one of the element that has changed our life, has changed our business model, has changed our marketing, uh, uh, has changed entirely uh, uh, our relation. And uh, 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 it looks to be a paradox, but we are much closer now, each other, that uh, uh, we talk from distance than uh, 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 we were in the past. But still, I want to say I love you all. Thank you very much indeed, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Gaetano, we love you too. Let's get to the panelists. So first up, Tyler Harris. Tyler leads McKinsey's global perspective on fine jewelry with a deep focus on technology enabled store operations and the store of the future. She's a GG from GIA as a fellow GG. I feel it's important to point that out and also holds an MBA from the Harvard Business School. Tyler, good morning to you. Welcome. You're joining us from New Jersey, from your home office in New Jersey. Good morning. Yes, I am. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to see you all. Thank you so much. And we'll be talking with you extensively about the McKinsey and Business of Fashion report on state of fashion, watches and jewelry. So thank you for joining us as one of the authors of that report. Absolutely. Next. And next, we go to uh, just down the road from me in London, Mahia Bohanju. Mahia has a unique mix of international experience, gained leading operations with world renowned companies in luxury, financial services, technology, consumer travel, and hospitality industries. After senior executive roles with De Beers and Venus Jewels, he joined Uni Diamonds in 2019 as CEO. He's also a second time participant on Jewelry Industry Voices. So Mahia, welcome back. How are you this afternoon? Hot and steamy. Uh, and I think the difference between the UK and perhaps other parts of the world that are hot and steamy is the fact that we have no air conditioning in our homes. So <laughs> nice to be with everyone. If you do see beads of, of sweat on, on top of my head, I assure you it's not because I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but lovely to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for the panelists and Sip Joe and everyone who's attended. No problem. Those beads may just look like clarity characteristics on your diamond behind you. So um, <laughs> next up, let's turn to Alan Chan across in Hong Kong, where it really is steamy and hot at this time of year. So Alan is the general manager of the Group Branding Center for Chow Tai Fook Jewelry Group. Asia's largest jewelry retailer. He joined Tao Tai Fook in 2010, and he's now responsible for the branding and marketing management of the group. And Alan is a third time veteran of Jewelry Industry Voices. You're a glutton for punishment, Alan. Thank you very much for joining us again. Yes, nice, nice to be here, coming back again. And um, um, good evening to you all from a steamy hot uh, place in Hong Kong as well. Welcome. Last but definitely not least, another part of the world that's renowned for heat, Mithun Sachetti, 
Mithun was named among GQ magazine's 50 most influential young Indians. I think well, the best thing about that is being described as young Mithun. We like that. Um, he's the founder of India's leading omnichannel jeweler, Carrot Lane. Along with his co-founder, he started Carrot Lane in 2007, giving India its first online jewelry destination. Mithun hails from a family of five generations of jewelers and is a returning jewelry industry voices panelist. Mithun, it's so great to have you back with us. Thanks for your time today. Thank, thank you very much, Ed, for having me back over here. Looking forward to a good interactive session. Uh, I speak from Chennai, which is always hot. Somehow it's a better day today. We passed it on to the rest of the world. Yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate that. So please note, as we get started, none of the opinions or information offered in this web webinar constitutes legal, financial, or official advice from any of the panelists or myself. Sibjo provides a global perspective on the German jewelry industry. So please, for more precise information, we encourage you to play an active part in your local trade associations and to seek advice relevant to your location and business. Now, according to Wikipedia's timeline for the development of e-commerce, the first online sales transaction was of cannabis in 1971 or 1972 between US students. And this was later described as the seminal act of e-commerce. It's interesting that they couldn't recall exactly which date the sale took place. But anyway, in 1984, the first comprehensive electronic commerce service was launched by CompuServe in the US and Canada. And the term e-commerce was coined by Dr. Rab Robert Jacobson, who was a consultant to the California State Assembly Committee. Now it's widely agreed that the luxury jewelry industry was a late adopter to e-commerce. And we're gonna explore that and explore the reasons for that uh, in a minute. But even we can see clearly that's true because even large retailers such as Chowtai Fook only started their e-commerce programs 10 years ago. But COVID changed the game. One of the main industry trends accelerated by COVID-19 and identified in McKinsey's recent report on the state of the jewelry and watch industry is digital transformation. Noting that the pandemic has fundamentally reset expectations for both consumers and companies, the report said, and I quote, the onus will be on business leaders to create compelling online solutions that serve a clear customer need and measure up to trusted face-to-face -face interactions, which form part of the magic of the in-person buying experience. So let's dive in and explore those digital strategies with leaders from China and India and an online diamond trading ecosystem. And firstly, one of the authors of that McKinsey report, Tyler, if I can turn to you first. So as we know, and as is identified, digital sales in fine jewelry have historically lagged other categories and digital is not new, we know that. So from your perspective, why has fine jewelry been so slow, relatively speaking, to move online? And can I follow that up with a second question is, what is the outlook for digital sales of fine jewelry in the next few years? Sure, um, and, and you're exactly right that jewelry has been quite slow, relatively speaking, to move online. And it was, um, it was funny, Ed, when we were writing the report and kind of figuring out what the main themes and shifts were going to be, and it was clear that online and a move to digital was one of them, we did have to step back and say, okay, is, is this really a meaningful trend to highlight given it is in many sectors old news? Uh, but for, for this sector, it is not. It is new news just in large part of um, the speed at which um, jewelry industry overall has moved online. Um, and in 2019, 13% of 
sales and fine jewelry were online, which again, comparatively speaking, is quite low. Um, there are a number of reasons for this. Um, a couple of the main ones are, one, when you look back to the history of the industry, it, it is in large part rooted in a lot of local independent jewelers who for you know, a long time, you know, didn't necessarily need or need to move online or have the resources to move online. And so when you have this really fragmented base, um, the movement is slower. Um, that is obviously compounded by all of the things that you mentioned about the magic of the in-person experience um, and fit and trial and things like that. Um, but the customer, even before COVID, right, we saw the customer moving online um, in other categories and fine jewelry was, um, was going to be at a tipping point at some point. We didn't know that COVID was gonna come, but COVID really hit that tipping point and put gas on the fire of the change that was already underway. So when we look forward uh, into 2025, um, we are expecting about 20% of the market to be online and fine jewelry, which from a 2019 to 2025 growth rate is about nine to 12%. It's pretty massive. It's three times faster than the overall growth of the market. And so we look forward and this really is when we reflected on, you know, is this a theme that we think is real to highlight those numbers to us say very clearly, yes. Great, okay, thank you. Well, thank you for the report as well. And I'm just posting in the chat, um, hopefully in a minute, the, the, the link to it so that people can, can check it out if they haven't already. And I strongly recommend um, having, a, having a read of, through of that report. Now, you know, that online experience, that unique magic of selling jewelry in a retail store is, 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 is what players who are operating online need to develop. So I'd like to turn to the two big retailers in the room here. Um, Alan, if I can turn to you first in Hong Kong and ask, from your perspective with Chow Tai Fook, what do consumers expect when they're shopping online? And, and how do you, as a company, make that experience as enjoyable as possible? I think uh, right now, when, when we talk about e-commerce, the most important keyword for us is, is traffic. Because there are so many people browsing through the internet every day, especially for consumers in China, they, they're, they're not using computer or, or tablet, but most of them are using mobile phone. So when they want to purchase a piece of jewelry, the first thing is to, to go to browse, go to, to search engine. And then that kind of traffic would ultimately, from, from brand perspective, we want to divert that traffic to, to our e-commerce site. And this is the, the first criteria is convenience, I would say, especially during the, the pandemic. This trend is, is really important. Compare it to the traditional retail business, people need to visit to our point of sales, and then we got the chance to, to sell the product. But right now, in terms of, of the internet world, people get used to browse things around, and if they see something interested, that's the beginning of the consumer journey. So that's why I think the, the first point is the traffic is the key, and then is how you present the product. Because for us, after 10 years of op operation in e-commerce, our e-commerce sales still accounts for, for less than 5% of our group's turnover. And, and the average ticket size is about 200 to 250 US. So it seems that there's a, a ceiling. After all, jewelry needs certain kind of ex experience. So that's why I, I think experience is another key of uh, how we can move e-commerce for jewelry forward. And, and, you know, Chow Tai Fook is a, is a large retailer with thousands of physical stores um, in Asia. And if we turn to, to, uh, to India and Mithun, you know, you started as e-commerce, but you now have well over 100 uh, physical stores around India. So can I pose the same question to you? What do consumers expect when shopping online and how do you make the experience as enjoyable as possible at Carrot Lane? Um, very different journeys um, when you start online and then you build stores, uh, which you see around the world today, seems to be the way people are going about it, as opposed to uh, when you build stores and uh, you go online. I, my partners in India, the Tata group, have uh, uh, 
the other journey, which is they're the largest retailers over here and they have that journey. Um, the consumer actually, if, if you think about yourself as buying anything today, you browse online and then you decide where you want to shop. But your discovery entirely sits online today. And um, if uh, Alan spoke very uh, correctly about, uh, you know, uh, helping aid discovery, and that's the first experience that anybody has with, with a brand. Is that how well can I discover what I want? What can the brand do to increase the desire of, um, I mean, I might need to buy something, that might be the reality, but I, can I convert that into, I want to buy something. Mm. And that is effectively the role that the website needs to play. And that's the job that we as, um, uh, as the product managers of the website or as people who create photography for the website or create engagement on the website, that is the goal that we work towards. That how do we create a desire which makes people move from need to want on, uh, for, for their uh, purchase? The more we do that, I think the faster we'll keep growing and uh, we'll keep uh, aiding consumers from buying. Um, challenge in a place like India or in China, for that matter, is not going to be the number of people. It's always going to be that we're not as organized as countries as possibly America is or Europe is. So logistics, uh, fulfillment, all of these are challenges for us. Um, to overcome these challenges, uh, we need to remove all the frictions and barriers which are there in the minds of the consumers. And we look at every link, every single um, opportunity that comes our way to remove these frictions and barriers in the, um, in the journey of the consumer. The more we can remove, the higher goes the conversion. The best case jewelry business conversion scenarios are about 3% online, the best case. Mm. Uh, and most are sub 1%. Uh, so it just tells you it's such an amazing opportunity to keep improving on the experience and keep going higher and higher up on uh, conversion for people. So um, you could look at it two ways. We've all done a poor job till now, or the channel has a mistrust of the consumers um, in various ways uh, to aid discovery, to solve fulfillment, to make the moment of truth at which one person gives this jewelry to another come alive, uh, if you divide our journey in each of these buckets, we work towards improving the experience in all of these areas. And there are teams allocated for each of these things. And, and when we were preparing, you highlighted a really interesting thing that you were working on when you're trying to provide that experience was, you just mentioned to me, midnight delivery. Um, yes. Which I'd like to share, I just think is a wonderful concept. As somebody who just went through a birthday with my wife, you know, the concept of being able to have a, a present delivered at the minute of the day of the event. I mean, unless of course you're fast asleep and you're annoyed that somebody knocks on your door, but I think it's a wonderful experience for people. Yeah, so um, look, it's a privilege to be in the jewelry business. One has to think about that somebody opens doors to let you be a part of their celebration. 70, 80% of jewelry purchase happens because they want to celebrate an engagement or a birthday. And if one has to uh, treat this privilege and say that, what can I do to add my value to it? One of those could be, uh, you know, celebrate at midnight and be there at that point. So you, you aid the surprise that somebody might plan for, or um, you could do 20 other things to help proposals or many other things that can happen as well. Also. So, those are some of the areas that we're working towards. There are some men who uh, struggle to make the right decision and we help them select five and say that surprise with five and then see what she likes and we'll send the other four back. Yeah. So probability of success goes up five times on that. Uh, our aim is to just make whoever is the person giving the gift look like a winner. And we have the privilege of playing that role. And so we take that seriously and work towards that. And thanks for letting me give away that little USP that you've been developing there. Much appreciated. Um, Mahir, can we turn to you from your perspective as, as a, a long-term player in the diamond business? What needs to be done to transform jewelry retailer? And, and do the consumer actually want those changes? Um, thanks for that question. So uh, 
look, the consumers are, are changing. Uh, you know, my, my parents and grandparents and my nieces are completely different in their behavior and what they do. Uh, today, if you have someone in their mid twenties to even mid forties, I still consider mid forties young. <clears throat> um, they, um, the first thing they do is go online uh, to check out anything. They want a, a question answered. They're, they're asking Google. They want something uh, to, to be responded to. They're, they're trying to figure that out from, from online. And as, as it was mentioned already by, by Tyler, a lot of the, the search and needs starts on Pinterest, starts on, on um, uh, you know, Google Images or, or something in, in that realm or in various different retail stores and, and online retail stores to see what am I interested in buying? What should it be? How much are the prices? What, what's the, the product like? But I think what makes our, our, our industry so unique is, is that we still have a lot of questions that, cons uh, that consumers have that they need answered. And, uh, and that cannot be answered through uh, just a website, which is why these uh, experience zones become critical. And, and the way that, that uh, some of the online companies have partnered up with retailers to be able to sell directly into retail and therefore have a space within that retail store to, uh, to bring that trust factor in, into the business becomes quite, quite critical. Consumers want an individualistic uh, and bespoke experience. Uh, every single one of the, the consumers that I've seen thus far in, in the most recent day, uh, days, uh, they're continuously trying to see not what is exactly what the other person has, but what is it that I can give to the person that I love that's unique for her or unique for him. That's what makes the experience even better. And, and as this continues and as this grows, our retail work also needs to grow and, and develop with that and listen to the customers and, and what they want and where they want to be. Can I stay with you, Mike, here? Because I'd like to move on to some questions about, about innovation and how innovation can drive progression here. Um, now, it, what characterized the Uni Diamonds platform was not only that you took elements of the traditional diamond business online, but it created capacities and even business models that didn't really exist in the trade before, particularly in the midstream in the trading section. How do you judge that success today in trying to get the industry to adopt those new technologies uh, in general? And do you believe that the industry is using technology effectively to sell diamonds? Uh, in, in certain sectors of, of the industry, like for example, in manufacturing, certainly there's a lot of uh, things that have been done. But if you look at the midstream itself, I think we're developing and evolving. And that's why you know, we came up with things such as what you're seeing online right now with uh, our, our data analytics tool, which is looking at somewhere around um, five to 600 million stones on a daily basis and analyzing availability within market, market prices, um, what we call the scarcity index. For me, and that's on the lower right-hand side, the heat map. Scarcity index, I think McKenzieites would actually appreciate that, by the way. Uh, the scarcity index is, is something quite critical for, for, for the industry to understand how is the market uh, moving, what is hot and what is not. And hot by definition is what, it, where, where in the categories of goods are we seeing an increase in price and a decrease in volume? Where are we seeing an increase in, 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 in price, but a, also an increase in volume? And then obviously what's not is where are the price is decreasing and, and, and uh, how's that in, uh, impacting the volume of, of, uh, of the goods available in that area? To have this sort of big data analyzed and bring it into the industry really helps bring transparency to the business. Where are we moving to? What's critical? You know, uh, in, in various different platforms online today in the midstream, everyone looks at searching for goods and focuses on the lowest common denominator as the pricing. Is that right? It, you know, but when we're looking at pricing and data and information, you should be looking at, at various aspects of price. What is the average price? What's the, you know, uh, 95th or 5th percentile? Those are the things that we look at. And why do we look at it this way? Because we know that diamonds are not always the same. 
there are diamonds that are more expensive and better quality, cut better. Even, even within an excellent cut, excellent polish and excellent symmetry of rounds, you still see a, a variation of 20% on pricing. Why? Well, there's a reason behind it. So to bring that transparency into the industry and allow people to really understand this can really transform the business. But I think we, we, we took the data and we said, let's use it in a way that allows the industry to be successful, to bring that, that uh, transparency into the industry, which then will allow other industries to want to come back in, into our industry and invest in it. Uh, that's what Uni was, was uh, um, you know, set up to do and, and, and has a desire of, of, of creating. Uh, the fact that every single product on our platform is live, we, we, we're proud that we're not actually the largest platform on this industry. We have roughly about $2 billion of inventory, uh, 600,000 stones or so, 200 different uh, uh, manufacturers and wholesalers that we work with. But there's a reason why we are that way. We are that way because we want to make sure the data that we have is transparent. The information that we have has origin information, has location information, which helps us with our fulfillment and logistics. Uh, and it gives transparency to the end retailer on where they should go and what we should do, what they should do. We, 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 we developed various different uh, technologies like the uni calculator. It's free to download for people who are within the diamond and jewelry industry to understand what market price trends are, how our price is moving and, and where the prices are going. And also new technological innovations that we're gonna be launching uh, and we continue to launch that will hopefully mesmerize the consumer and want to give them a better experience in store so that they can be more successful and, and the retailer can be more successful in, in, in being able to sell to the consumers, even if the diamond is not physically there within their retail store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, touching on that is, is so important about the data and big data has been what's driven forward so many businesses and the jewelry industry is, is really starting to get to grips with it. And, Alan, as, as, as a well-equipped um, retailer to invest and look at different innovations, can I turn to you and, and, and think about d big data and artificial intelligence? I mean, how, how are they helping Chowtai Fook to create a better experience and also more sales? But, uh, you know, we want to focus on how you, how you develop the best experience using technology. Yes, I think we can illustrate with um, um, one or two examples that are some tools that we've um, developed and we are using in our point of sales. One is called what we call um, cloud kiosk. You can imagine it's like a big iPad with a, a 1.5 meter high. So it's one meter wide. So it's a, a big iPad in, in uh, more than 1000 point of sales in our, our main in China stores. So this big iPad is, is to enhance um, customer experience. We use um, artificial intelligence to, to guess what the customer wants. They can play around the screen and they can, they can choose how uh, they like rings or pendants or any kind of, of um, uh, jewelry category. And then we'll counter propose, like, like Amazon, you've got a, a you may also like the, the list. So this is what we are trying to, to use big data and, and um, artificial intelligence to, to enhance customer experience, to increase the chance of selling. And also we can introduce some of the, the products that are not in the store. Because in the, in the store, we, we cannot uh, show all the, the skills, but we've got a, a inventory back in the warehouse. We've got real-time access to, to our inventory. So, People, um, the consumers, they can choose in the store and we can counter propose some of the design or some of the products that's not available in the store. So all these are trying to, to maximize the chance of selling and also to minimize the inventory level in the point of sales. And, and those cloud kiosks, I remember when you were with us before, they were a, a feature of a, a test brand that you started, the, the Z Plus stores that you started during the pandemic. Um, are there any other initiatives that Chow Tai Fook has been bringing into your, your diamond business that are bringing changes? Yes, another uh, project we, we started four or five years ago is a project called T-Mark. This is a, um, a diamond uh, label, and we are trying to introduce traceability 
to consumers. I think it's quite similar to, to uh, what Mahir just mentioned in the midstream. We're trying to do it on the downstream. So we want to get um, the, all the diamonds, they're, they're traceable, we can show to our customers where are these stones are coming from. They're from a particular country, a particular mine. And also um, we are also introducing blockchain to this project. So we are working with Tracer and, and uh, all the blockchains project. So we want to give our consumers a more reliable experience and, and more technological platform for the consumer to try when they're, they're buying diamonds. Thank you. Can I remind the audience that if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and um, we'll get to them at the end. So thank you. Um, we talked a little bit there about AI, artificial intelligence, there's other subsets like machine learning and other areas. Um, but augmented reality is something that, that really fascinates me and how we can actually um, project images of jewelry onto people while they're shopping online. Now, um, Mithun, can I ask you for, for Carrot Lane, are you doing much work with augmented reality? Is it, is it effective at the moment for selling jewelry online? Um, so we're doing a lot of work on it. There's a five member team that's been working on it for a couple of years now. And uh, um, some work in house, some work outsourced as well um, of that. Uh, we don't think uh, it's there yet. And, uh, but we continue to work on it because we feel AR is still a meaningful AR is still a couple of years away. It, the gadgets are very clunky right now. The, um, uh, the metal uh, that we play with has a luster, which is very hard to capture in the number of frames that, um, that images transfer at today on the internet as well also. So there are many challenges. It's nice to look at, it gives you a sense of size, but it doesn't help you sufficiently to make a buying decision. Uh, now, uh, we used to have something called Virtual Try-On before, which, um, uh, which we ran till about six, eight months back. We don't do that anymore. Uh, it helps you uh, engage with consumers for sure. And if you look at it as an engagement tool, it works. But if you look at it as a transaction driver, it doesn't do that right now. Um, in a store, sometimes it's sort of challenging to try on 20 earrings, um, but digitally, if you can record your video one time and then try all earrings on your face, turn left, right, and everything, and you can do that, that sort of stuff it can do. Um, it's not strong enough yet, but the good part is, you know, every industry has a, has a pulse rate. I like to believe that there is a rate of change at which the industry operates, and the rate of change for the jewelry industry is fairly slow. And because it's slow, we can afford to wait uh, and get it right and then come back with it. Um, so the work will go on. And when we feel we feel it's confident, we're confident enough that it helps people make a buying decision, we would bring it in the forefront. Till such time, we don't bring it in because we've seen with virtual try-on as well, that it tends to, it gets you somewhere there, but it doesn't give you enough. And even if you were going to make a decision, it sort of takes you away from making a decision. Uh, it, cre it leaves an element of doubt. And so we don't want to have that on a digital platform because anyways, you can't feel it. And if you now see that it doesn't look how what you think it was, uh, it sort of doesn't let you go one step forward. Yeah, I think that's an interesting concept though, of course, that you know, they could try on very quickly 20 different earrings, which narrows down the time that they're in store because they know which ones they want to look at in person. Um, Tyler, can I turn to you, you know, from your research and knowledge, what are the main uses for artificial intelligence and, and augmented reality from your research for jewelry retailers? And, and do you know anybody who's using them really effectively and give examples? Yeah. So I think the points that folks have made so far on how far along the technology is are, are very good ones, right? With, um, with AI and, and with a lot of applications of AR um, and jewelry, they're still relatively in the nascent stage. Um, there are, if I think about AI, you know, potential applications throughout the supply chain, right? When you go, you go back all the way into design, you've got some folks that are doing some interesting things with AI to 
to design you know, the most aesthetically pleasing um, pieces of jewelry, you can kind of move it forward into the store experience that Ellen described very well for what they're doing in their stores. Um, you can also use AI for, as an operational tool to, to predict demand in your stores or demand to your site and make sure that you are staffed or resourced appropriately. So all throughout the value chain, there are potential applications. Um, I think the thing to that that we'll talk a lot about at McKinsey is our use cases. What are you applying the technology for? Uh, because in a lot of instances, and in the jewelry industry um, is no exception to this, people get very excited about the new tech, right? You get very excited about AR, about AI, um, and lose sight of the core goal and the why for implementing it and start chasing after things that are really cool and very interesting, but aren't actually serving the need that you need to serve for your customers. And so staying really, really anchored in that use case and what you are applying these technologies for, um, that, that's what really separates folks. Um, one example uh, that I'll give on what you were talking about, AR in particular, we actually at McKinsey um, set up a store of the future um, in the Mall of America in Ma Minneapolis a couple of years ago. And we actually tested um, live some AR technologies for, for jewelry try-on. Um, and your point, your point is really interesting because what, what we found is one of the biggest unlocks was the data that we got from that. It was less about actually seeing how the earrings looked on you, but it was being able to connect Tyler to the 10 different earrings that I tried on and use that information to tailor marketing messages and outreach afterwards. Um, and so that, that really was the power because it gave us permission to contact the customer and start a conversation with the customer that went beyond that one interaction in the store. So um, I would really echo what you what you said before, that the power is not just in the, in the moment experience, but what happens afterwards. And Alan, I saw you... Alan, I saw you agreeing with that, and uh, Mithan, I'll come to you in a minute as well. But uh, Alan, I know when, when we were talking, you were talking about Chowtai Foot's smart trays. Can you tell us briefly a little bit about that? I think it's very similar to what Tyler just mentioned, and we, we did try to put it in our point of sales. Every piece of our product has a RFID attached to it, and then we implement what we call smart tray. That means for every product the, the customer put it on, we've got a, uh, a data on it. So we collect lots of data to, to reveal uh, what the products are selling, but most important for us are for those products that are not selling. For example, the particular design, consumer put it on for 20 times, but we didn't sell it. So there must be problems for, for these kind of product. And these two help us to, to get a lot of big data in terms of um, uh, other than sales, we got, data for those products that are not selling. Yeah. So these are very in, uh, important for us for our infantry planning. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mithan, you had something to add and then we can go to Mahir as well. Yeah, actually, um, um, I was adding to Tyler's point and I'm laying it out for uh, smaller retail businesses as well also, that one way of solving this is, um, uh, you know, having simple store check-ins um, and getting people to use uh, QR codes to do check-ins in the stores and then being able to track this at a, at a smaller level. That the number of, um, if you can connect people's mobile devices to what they come in with, and then if you're able to, I mean, we use another system very similar to what Alan speaks of with RFID, which identifies those pieces of jewelry as well. Um, that automatically connects the two and then retargeting becomes that much easier through the stores. In the online world, of course, this happens naturally when people look at a product and then they, what they add to cart or do anything with that. That retargeting, we take it back into the store. But even the absence of uh, virtual or AR, people will be able to do this in, in simpler forms now. They don't have to depend on uh, uh, tech breakthroughs to do this. Mahir, you had something to add as well. Yeah, I think the um, obviously the experience on, online and the experience in retail could be actually quite different. And, and to some extent, I have a, a slight different angle towards this because we've actually been piloting this 
uh, and are going to fully launch it in, uh, in, in the Vegas show. Uh, and that's really being able to, uh, uh, through technology, no matter where Diamond is in, in the world, to be able to virtualize that. Um, and, and I guess the best way to explain this is, is show it, if, if, if I may. But, but secondary to that, I think the, the, um, the way to start this is, is imagine you're going into a retail store and you see a beautiful ring that has a one carat diamond in it. You know that the person you're going to marry wants a two carat or a three carat stone and, or wants an oval rather than a round. Uh, and you want to ask them, well, what would this look like with an oval? Um, a, they may not have that in the inventory. B, if they do have it in an inventory, it might be set on a different ring and they can't get it out. So they're fidgeting and trying to kind of show you exactly what that would look like. So in order to capture that consumer's experience and, and make it much more effective, using technology can actually transform their experience. And that, along with the data that we're getting from what people are trying on and what people are testing, what, what people enjoy, are, are key reasons why we actually developed the technology that we did. And, and, and I'm sorry, but I'm gonna be a bit finicky now. Um, if, if I may have access or permission to be able to share my screen. Um, my here, let's see if, let's see if you click on the share screen. It uh, may it have to... Only the host can share this meeting. Try now. Try now. Okay, let's see here. You cannot start screen sharing while the other participant is sharing. Try again. I've clicked another button. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm going to share my entire screen. So if you see anything um, that, that you don't, you shouldn't, I apologize. Um, but here we are. Uh, I'm going to go to the uni retailer app, which is something that we have within uh, various different retail stores around, around the world, um, focused around in, in the United States. I'm picking uh, a size. Uh, a, a shape. I'm picking what people really, really love buying these days, which are GHI colors, VS quality uh, to SI1. And then you'll see an array of diamonds at retail prices. Um, and, and you're going through and scrolling through and, and consumer says, oh, that seems to be a nice one. Excuse me for, for scrolling so fast. Um, That's nice. Can we can we try this one on? Yeah, it also had an asset image as well. So um, you're looking at this particular stone, you see the unique characteristics of the stone, you get to see the details of the stone, the parameters, uh, GIA would love this, of the stone, brought to you by the Gemological Institute of America. Um, and so you get the whole uh, experience, but the next experience that, that I think is, is quite critical is being able to virtualize that diamond on, on your hand or, or um, uh, be able to see what that would look like. Now, with this particular case, you can move it up and down so that it sits on a, a, a ring itself. Once it sits on that ring, no matter which way you go, by the way, this is that diamond that I showed you. You'd be able to actually move your hand, no matter which way you move your hand, the diamond will move with you. Um, and in addition to that, let's say uh, well, you're in Israel. Well, there you go, you can put it on a different finger. Um, you know, you're in India uh, and, and you really would like to have uh, good positive energy and karma. There you go. You can put it on, on, on your index. You're in Italy, like our godfather. Um, and there we go. You can put it on, on, on your pinky. And in addition to that, you can transfer and transform it. If you're a designer and want to put it in a different way in the ring, so it matches the ring itself, it becomes really important. So when you're looking at something like a semi-mount, uh, this becomes a perfect tool for it. When you have a ring that doesn't have a three carat oval and it has a two carat uh, round, you can now be able to show the stone exactly as it would look like on that finger. So it, it helps in a lot of ways be able to, to provide uh, much more in-depth in information to a, a customer, but also get them excited about the story of the diamond. What is this diamond going to provide us? Why is this diamond so important? Um, so not only you can give the history and, and, and the details and the origin, 
but you can really link that consumer to a specific diamond and let them see what it would look like, even if it is sitting in Mumbai, India, or in Tel Aviv, Israel. So I think it's, it's the, the, the retail experience is and should be moving more towards a, a, a digitized format that makes sense. Thank you for that. You're getting a, some comments, you know, amazing and really customer engagement and nice in the chat. So I think that's quite impressive. So thank you for letting us see that before you launch it at, uh, at, at Vegas. It's Next just month. between us and the 400 that are on this call. Yeah, there you go. Bingo. <laughs> um, let, let's, let's finish up by talking about the store of the future, if we can. Um, we've got 10 minutes left and I'd like to leave some time for, uh, for questions. So Tyler, can I start with you and I'll ask the big question with all this discussion, are retail stores dead? And if not, what's the role of the store versus digital in the future? So the, the short answer is no, stores are, stores are not dead. I'm a big believer in stores and particularly in this category. Um, when, when you have just such an emotional purchase, and an emotional experience. Um, and when you look at the numbers, right, we're sitting here talking a lot about the growth of online and the growth of digital to 20% of the market, which is staggering for, um, for where this industry has been in the last couple of years. But that still means that 80% of the purchases are going to be made in person, right? So the, the store is still going to be um, a really, really important part of, um, of jewelry for the foreseeable future. Um, I think, I think the, those who will really win are ones who figure out how to blend the store and online or technology together, much like Mary, you were just sharing with some of the technology that you all are, are launching, right? Those who, who meld the two together and don't think about just the digital experience or just the store experience um, are, are the ones that are going to win. And I'll, I'll give one example um, that we've started to see a bit more of the pandemic, and I'm hopeful that we'll see more of it moving forward. Um, but, but it's how you think about your people in your stores, your sales associates, and using them as, um, as a really incredible resource, right? Because the typically people in, in your jewelry stores are great at selling, great at education, great at building an experience and a personal connection, but they're not always busy, right? You don't always have enough people in a physical retail store to occupy 100% of those very talented people's time. So how you think about using them online to answer video chats or to clientele people remotely, right? Connecting those dots not only helps you helps you kind of build um, build more customer experiences and reach more people, but you're also more efficient from a store perspective when you when we are going to be going into an environment where stores are going to be under pressure from an ROI perspective. So, um, so that's but one example. There are many, many others, but the magic really will be in those who connect the dots between, between the two for consumers. Thanks. Up on screen, we've got a, a photo which Mahir shared with us, which is a store from the 1890s. And Mahir, I mean, how do you see uni and other platforms and other, other players working for the digital transformation? And, and how do we move away from, from that model and into what I think you're gonna talk about with this model? On yeah, no, I, I, that, um, it, it's all around you know, building that transparency and trust with the consumer itself, being able to show them how rare a product is. Imagine being able to stand in a retail store and say, this two carat GSI one triple X none that you have, there's 300, 300 of these stones available in the market today, right? So to be able to have that sort of power and talk about the rarity of the product that you're selling and being able to communicate the true effect of, of this product and, and where it's come from and, and the nature of it, the story of it. You know, Al Rosa has a, a, a phenomenal story that they're telling today to consumers about not only where the stone came from, but which mine, what part of the mine it came from. Mm -hmm. you, you know, to be able to, to transfer that story to the consumer, it only helps bring that trust with the consumer. You know, there, there's a lot of questions around is, is mine diamonds an effective uh, product to sell downstream five to 10 years from now? 
well, if it's just purely because of mind, you know, everything that we use today is mind. Everything that we built, the wind turbines that we built are made of steel. And guess where steel comes from? It's mind. Uh, the electronics that we use, every product within that electronic is somehow either mined or, or, or created uh, from, from uh, uh, a product that's mined. Yeah. So when we look at the, the overall business to transform the industry, we need to utilize the best of the old school and, and new school. Today, when you look at a retail store, uh, you have curves in, in, in the, uh, in, in the uh, show screens. But how great would it be, like do what Chow Tai Fook does for each product that, that you're actually showing to be able to use RFID to actually talk about the story of that product? Yeah. How great would it be to be able to virtualize a product that may not physically be there, but gives them an, a, an understanding of what that product would be if they were to wear it, if they had it on their hand? Yeah. So the, the creation and, and the coming together of the two, to, uh, the old and, and the new, is, is where I believe the future of retail is going to be. And, and finally, though, my last thought about retail is it's no longer just in retail stores. A salesperson is selling at midnight when they're having dinner or at a party with friends or is selling at 6 a.m. after they've taken a shower or gone for the run because someone needs a, a, a pair of studs, someone needs a jewelry piece for a celebration, et cetera. How, how wonderful would it be to provide that power in their hands so they can uh, uh, be able to be empowered to sell no matter where they are. Yeah. That's where I think the future of this industry is going to be. Thanks for that, wise words. I I'm conscious of the time and I do wanna to get to Alan and Mithun, but uh, Alan, you know, finishing up here before we get to the Q&A, how, how do you see technology really helping Chowtai Fook and your retail strategy going forward? Yeah, I, I fully agree with uh, what Tyler just mentioned. Our experience is we are not implementing technology uh, for the sake of the technology. After all, customer experience is, is most important because of jewelry, people still need to, to touch and feel. So technology can help us to, to enhance the experience, but, but I don't think we are, we're trying to, to replace the experience purely by, by technology. Mm. And, and myth, and lastly for you, what specifically what future technologies do you see as being the ones that will enhance that experience for the consumer? Um, look, I mean, first in the store of the future, um, the, hello? I can hear you now. Go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. What changes is the role of the future, a uh, role of the store. What doesn't change is the need of the store. The store of the future really uh, moves from being a point of discovery as it is today to becoming a larger point lower down in the funnel. If you were to think of the consumer, his discovery is more and more moving digital, but his needs for fulfillment are not moving digital at the same pace. So that 80% that even Tyler spoke of where people will come to the store and buy and seems like a reasonable number over there. For all of that, you require the, the store to, and the store then needs to operate more like that. That how do you build technology that allows you to fulfill more needs of people who have discovered online and now want to come and experience the same product in the store. And that's really the role of the future. Um, the other aspects of uh, technology that we are seeing benefits from is that uh, how do you mimic the consumer who buys on, who browses online and then visits the store? Um, the role of technology is to actually be like magic, be invisible, but empower the store to be able to have that same engaging conversation from the point that the consumer left it online. Uh, pick that up from there and be able to lift off and start having that conversation in the store. If you're not able to do that, then it will always stay as two separate channels. And that is not a happy scenario at all. Um, it really helps if we are able to connect this journey from one channel to the other, uh, the other channel, make it truly omni-channel because consumer actually is functioning like that. In his mind, he doesn't think that, he thinks I traveled on one brand. He doesn't think that I tra traveled on two different parts of a singular brand as well. When we built a hundred odd retail stores in any business, 
there was some sort of familiarity that was built between all the stores. And we do that because we want consumers to have some sort of seamless experience with the brand and same goes across channels as well. So we see all the role of, we see technology to play the role of becoming the seamless magician who helps consumers travel from online to retail and retail back into online seamlessly without realizing that there was any impact uh, that could have happened. Yeah, nice, nice way of thinking about it. As always, we're not getting this done within the hour. So I would like to ask a final question. And as we talked about, this is a quick fire question, um, quick answers. So in your opinion, and I'll come to you each in turn, in your opinion, what's the single most innovation that retailers should invest in for selling diamonds and diamond jewelry online? And by asking this question, I'm really thinking of, about those smaller independent jewelers that perhaps have less resources, time and money to invest in technology. What's the single most important thing? Alan, can I start with you going from the furthest time zone away from me in London? Yeah, I think for, for individual retailers, I, I like um, um, many of the, the retailers in, in um, Maine and China, they need to work with some existing platforms instead of working on their own. So for example, the, the uh, uh, big brothers like uh, Alibaba or Tencent, you need to rely on their technology, rely on their data, and that's a, a, an easier grab instead of start uh, from zero. Thank you. Tyler, can I go to you with the same question? Single most important factor to invest in. Sure. Um, my answer to that is anything that gives you actionable data. Uh, Meher said it really well in terms of the fact that data counterintuitively can actually be a remarkably powerful tool in telling stories. Um, and so anything that gives you actionable data, I think is um, quite interesting. Nice one, data, very important. Mahir, can I turn to you? Same question. Um, I, I, I'm not gonna say uh, call me at uni because that would be unethical. So I'm not gonna say that. But what I am gonna say is, uh, <laughs> Uh, use use the data to tell a story, and that is and 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 linking that with with various companies that allow you to do that would allow you to be successful uh, as a retailer. It's it's just the most critical thing for you to win today. Nice, thank you. And other brands of online diamond trading platforms are available, but thank you. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Method. Um, to me, honestly, I, uh, it's people who understand technology and investing in them. Um, it's, I've seen just too much and too many people uh, get all kinds of technology and have no idea what to do with it. And mm -hmm. to invest and understand how do you use whatever little bit of technology that you have to solve any problem that you want to solve um, is very important. So finding the right people who do it uh, is the most important uh, investment that someone could make. I'm going to turn to the questions. We've got a few here. Thank you for your time. Numbers are still strong listening in. We've still got 145 people on the call. So thank you for staying with us. Patrick Benick asks us the question, how do you see the new tech, AI, blockchain, et cetera, tools driving transparency, serving or servicing the independent jewelers, the mums and pots? And what responsibility do we as the leaders in this sector have to the trade at large? I could pick one of you, but who's comfortable with that question? How do we see the new tech serving the smaller mom and pop jewelers? Uh, okay, okay. Mithin first. Mithin right. first, please, yeah. Okay, um, you know, I, um, I spend a lot of time in mom and pop stores. My parents still run that and I spend enough time over there. Uh, even now on the weekends. Uh, it's, um, think of technology a lot like what marketing does to a business. It isn't the business, it's what enables the business. Uh, and, and all we need to figure out is that if we can take our discovery using technology into the hands of the consumer, I think that would be the place I would invest most and try and solve from there. Maya. 
Um, so first of all, uh, the, the latest technology, whoever you decide to partner up with, um, can allow you to be extremely successful. It can tell you what products you're buying, what products you should be buying, what products are more or consumers more interested in, in when they come into your retail store or when they're perusing your website. It, 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 and taking all that information and then being able to use things like the Diamonds Journey that, that you have from various different uh, um, organizations and groups. GIA has the uh, 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 Mine Origin, uh, Tracer has their own product um, uh, that, that's uh, more De Beer centric. Uh, and, and there are um, other uh, uh, groups that actually have blockchain and, and such. None of those are a, a, a product that will actually uh, finish uh, and, and develop what you need as, as an independent retailer. And it, a good independent retailer today tells a good story and tells a true story about the product they're selling where it's come from, the rarity of that product, how it, it came and, and became what it is today and can really transform the, the, the emotional purchase to that sentimental connection that a consumer, an individual will have with a product that they're buying. That is where a, a, a really great retailer can, can, can utilize the data and information that's out there and transform it to be able to sell more effectively. Thanks, we got another question here from Stephen, and I'd like to put this to Alan because we talked about TMARC and blockchain a little bit already from Chowtai Fook. But Stephen asks about diamond traceability and he says, diamond traceability seems a good experience, but in which way the source of the stone, e.g. from which mine, can it be verified? Is it based on the supplier's declared information? Alan, your thoughts on that question? Uh, for us, for us um, more than half of our stones, we started with our diamond rough. So that means we, we've, we know uh, who are supplying to us and, and especially we work with the beers and we, we work with Arosa and we work with uh, Real Tinto and we've got a program with them so we, we can have a transparent um, um, traceability showing to the consumer uh, which di uh, mining companies the stones are coming from. And on the other hand, I think some of the mining companies they're working on, on the upstream and midstream of the industry to provide traceability. And I hope that it'll, it'll come more with a different types of stones and uh, um, different sectors in, in upstream, midstream and downstream so that we can expand the, the traceability information to the consumers. Um, if I can just touch on that uh, as, as um, I actually rolled out, uh, help roll out the, the process for Venus Jewel uh, first of all, being a part of the Responsible Jewelry Council or a, an organization like that really helps, uh, especially if you're doing uh, anything like a, a, uh, a, a claim uh, or uh, you're using COC uh, chain of custody kind of uh, process where an auditor will come and validate how you actually trace your product from start to finish. Um, uh, it, it's, it, it can actually really help in order to ensure that the, the rough that you're receiving from Al Rosa, from the Beers, Rio Tinto Dominion, et cetera, have gone through a cycle to make sure that, that that's done. GIA also has got a, uh, a mine to market uh, uh, program, um, which uh, um, they actually do, which is a, a great program. They analyze the rough, and then when the polish is done, they validate if that polish came from that rough. Um, and obviously you have Tracer within the beers who actually looks at the rough and then it validates the polish based off of uh, the outcome uh, and, and looks back. Uh, and you also have Serene Technologies who has the data points from everything uh, all, from rough all the way through polish. So um, in, in all of those sectors and, and segments, you have so much immense data and information that you can actually be able to fully trace and understand where these diamonds come, are coming from. And a lot of the manufacturers are now more and more coming into this area because they have to supply people like Chatai Fook who insist on that uh, uh, guarantee. Uh, and they want to validate that guarantee. So a lot of the manufacturers are, are responding to the demand of the retailers because they know the consumers are needing that information or wanting that information. 
we've we've got a quick last question which fascinates me here from Pui Poon, who asks, how would you balance using tech to attract younger consumers and not alienating the older consumers who are less tech savvy, but are also your bread and butter? Tyler, I, I think your report sort of looked to this as well, a little bit about the demographics of the jewelry consumer. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's all about balance because you're exactly right. You've got younger populations where it is table stakes and the way that they learn about new players, the way that they explore, increasingly the way that they make purchases. Um, and then you've got older consumers that have um, different levels of technological fluency. Um, and so there's not a single silver bullet right answer. There needs to be a balance. Um, I think what what I would say regardless is, um, is that you have to humanize the technolo technological experience, right? Just having a technology um, out there that is, you know, purely for the sake of transaction or doesn't have a human element to it will likely not resonate with with consumers regardless of age. Um, so I think when you do when you do have the balance of the, the technology and the physical, making sure that that human element of it and humanizing the digital um, is really, really important. And I don't think that's going to go away um, just given the nature of this category. And like we've talked about um, for a bit, the emotional experience and how it's tied to important life events, right? The human has to be central to it, regardless of if you're a young consumer or an older consumer. I think that's a great way for us to end today's discussion because it is all about people and about giving the consumer what they want. And that is one of the most important things that the jewelry industry and retailers always need to keep front and center of their thoughts. Gaetano, it's been a great season, started in September. Here we are about to maybe go off for some summer holidays. Would you like, us, would you like to take us home with some thoughts? Well, let me... Uh say that I am impressed once more and again. And uh, when I did my uh, remarks at the beginning, I said, this caliber of speakers. Wow, what the speakers. <laughs> uh, Tyler, you have uh, expressed concepts uh, in uh, a so simple way that uh, uh, you are uh, clearly humanizing what McKinsey is doing. You represent McKinsey fantastically. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Alan, uh, and I go by my screen, okay? Uh, Alan, uh, again, you have given uh, an abstract, if I could say that, or a picture or a result of a scanning situation, how the market is uh, under the digital era. And I was thinking, meanwhile, you were talking about digitalization and all these elements related to the online sales. I was thinking, wow, I have to consider the fact that I need to talk with my good friend and our board members, Ken Wong, that you know very well, and remind that there is not only internet, but Cho Tai Fook has nearly 5,000 shops in China, <laughs> which, which is not exactly, you know, uh, uh, something digital, but is real. So congratulations for uh, uh, your comments. I am truly, uh, and I feel inspired. Meet them. Uh, to you, what can I say? I am, uh, I am truly impressed. You know, I have uh, uh, a number of uh, titles in terms of studying and university and the PhDs and so on. But uh, today, uh, once more and again, I have learned from you, from all of you, but from you with uh, 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 the fact that you talk to people and uh, I was feeling a pupil, you know, so you made me young. 
under this point of view. So thank you very much. Uh, Maya, you are uh, an incredible uh, marketer, uh, an incredible person, and uh, you have expressed, and when you show the screen, the way you do that, you know, this is very impressive because I go back. Meanwhile, you were talking, there was a picture on the screen of 1890, if I remember well. Uh, and in the meantime, I was thinking to my grand grandfather that used to go around with the car, with the horses uh, and uh, uh, to visit the clients at the time. Uh, uh, he used uh, uh, a boy with a window display on the shoulder and showed the uh, products. So I was thinking to that kind of uh, 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 window display and this kind of what you show as a window display. So the, the, the consideration is, is clear. We live in another world. We live under this point of view in a better world. And we all share all together, both who are on the screen and those who are following us, uh, uh, one important element, which is trust, reputation, honesty, and behind each one of us, there is a person with a face that is responsible for what everybody is doing. So I want to say responsibility is an element that we cannot uh, uh, certainly not only forget, but we have to take it so present to bring forward all together in order to have the responsibility toward the consumer who is uh, he or her is uh, the element that keep us successful or not. So I want to thank you very much indeed. I want to thank Ed and Stephen for the incredible season that we have had. Uh, and I know that we are uh, preparing for the next season starting in September, uh, something which uh, obviously is giving us more strength to go forward uh, to better uh, spread out the message that this industry is a wonderful industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gaetano. Um, in, in the spirit of transparency, um, we'd like to share with you some of our numbers, um, data. We talked about data throughout this presentation. So maybe I'll share just a few numbers with you from this past season. So we've had uh, 10 webinars, 11, including this one today. And we've had 48 panelists. Thank you to each and every one of them for giving our time. Uh, 4,280 viewers um, have joined us over the season They're with an average audience live each time of 170 um, and average views through the live and on YouTube of 428 per webinar. The most popular webinar we had was on pearl jewelry design back in February 2021 with 874 uh, views. And the highest live attendance, people joining us in the room, was uh, 338 for Gemstone Origin um, in May 2020. So we can see that also, if we put the next slide up, we've got, um, you know, we've, we've had a nice progression of um, audience throughout the year. We can see that there's a lot of interest in our audience for talk about pearls. That's the spike in the middle that you see there when we talked about pearls sponsored by the Cultured Pearl Association of America. We can also see that we get a real spike of interest every time we talk about colored stones. And in the case of um, the spike on the right-hand side of your screen on the graph, gemstone origin as well is particularly of interest to people. So thank you so much to everybody for having joined. Um, we feel really honored to have been able to work on these. We're working on season three now. In fact, we're just putting to bed the panelists for the, the first event that we've got in season three for Jewelry Industry Voices. And 
we're going to go fidgetal again, like we did last year, hybrid event, supported by uh, the Italian exhibition group and co-presented with the Responsible Jewelry Council. We're going to be diving into um, the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and meeting their challenge with two sessions, one on the role and influence of women and also one on sustainable jewelry. So you will be receiving the invitations for those if you are on our mailing list. Um, and also we'll be putting the information out on social media. So please be sure to follow and like us and all of that business that we do on social media. So that's it. That's a wrap for season two. What a pleasure. It's been for all of us to be able to co-moderate and deliver these events for you all. My thanks go to Stephen and to Gaetano. Um, my thanks go to four panelists today. We really thank you for your time um, and all the other panelists and all of the sponsors that we've had throughout the season, starting with Natural Diamond Council, the Platinum Guild International, Gem Cloud, and for today's webinar, Uni Diamonds and Mahia and the team there. So that's it from me. Thank you very much, everybody, to finish up. I'll leave the screen up because I know that sometimes people like to go through the chat. Um, sometimes when we're in this rooms and it suddenly finishes, you think, oh, I wanted to look back through the chat. So I'll leave it up for a few minutes. But thank you to everybody. Alan, have a good rest of your evening. Mithun, it's been great having you and your insights. Thank you. Uh, Tyler, it's, it's really always great to connect with another GG and to hear your experience and expertise. Please um, download the, uh, the, the report that McKinsey and others authored. Uh, it's in the chat and I'll be sending the link out with the follow-up email. Mahia, finally, thank you so much to you for sponsoring, but also for bringing that wonderful experience of how we can look at diamonds in a new way on your beautiful fingers. Thank you. Have a Thank lovely evening, much. everybody. All the best for the summer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.